It's a hospital. It's an emergency room. It's a pediatric ward. It's an intensive care unit. It's a surgical room. It's a psychiatric ward. <laughs> it's a repair center. It's tech support. It's a gym. It's a spa. It's a therapy center. It's spring training. It's a development league. It's a team effort headed up by able veterans helping super talented rookies. It's home base. It's home plate. It's the dugout. It's the bench. It is church. It's the place we ought to spend more time, uh, but it's the first place we drop if something better comes along. It's easy to skip, uh, but it's difficult to get back to. We love the fellowship. We don't like the accountability. It's like being afraid that you're really, really sick, but you don't really want to go to the doctor. And we expect so much from it, but we put so little into it. And Jesus has left us with three things in this world. He's left us with his word, with his Holy Spirit, and he's left us with this, the church. The church. We look at the church, not just this church, but church in general, and what do we see? And when I ask you, you know, when we look at the church, what do we see? The tendency is to look around the room, look at the building, the decor, the jumbotrons, here in this vast auditorium, uh, you might even look at the man in the pulpit. <laughs> but if there's one thing that we don't often look at, and that's how God sees the church. So how does God see the church? Open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. Now, I know what you're thinking. Hey, wait a second. What happened to our study in 1 Peter? Well, we'll get back there. But every year... I kind of like to start off the year with an idea or with a theme that I hope some of us can carry through the year. And, uh, and this year, uh, to start off the year, I want to talk about church. So we're going to take a few Sundays we're going to talk about church. And uh, this is not a series of sermons about how you ought to come to church more often. It's not that at all. Uh, but it is a, a view of the church that I think maybe we don't always take. And in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 19, we have this very important and very famous passage of verses. So Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 13, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is the first use of the word church in the New Testament, really in, in the entire Bible. We get the word church from a Greek word, ecclesia, and ecclesia means an assembly. That's all it means, nothing particular. It's an ecclesia. You go to a basketball game, there's an ecclesia there. It's a gathering of people come to see a basketball game, and there's not too many reasons that are better to gather together than to watch a basketball game uh, or church or go to In-N-Out. So, this, you know, we drove to church. We drove to Southern California last Sunday. All the In-N-Outs were closed because it's Christmas Day, which I love and appreciate, but... That was a tough drive. <laughs> that was a tough drive, I gotta tell you. <laughs> it's my car, it's like my car just automatically turns there and it's like, for what? For what? It's weird, it's weird. An ecclesia, an assembly. Now this word in the early days of the church never meant the building or the place of worship, although it does come to mean that now. You know, we look at that building and we say, well, that's the church or that's a church. 
because, well, it looks like a church, or if you're in, you come to Calvary Chapel, well, that's our church, even though you know it looks like an office building. It, it still is, is a church. And in the New Testament, there are five primary words that are used for the church. They all have similar meanings, but there's three that are the most common. And, and they are, first of all, letter A is uh, just an assembly. That's an ordinary assembly of people in the classical sense. Uh, it doesn't mean anything other than that. You can see that word used that way in Acts chapter 19 and verse 32, verse 39 and 41. Uh, like, uh, for instance, the gathering of people that assembled to riot against Paul in Ephesus. You can read about that in the book of Acts. But that's just an assembly of people. Letter B, the second one is the whole body of professing Christians throughout the world. That is also referred to as the church in the Bible. You can see that word used in 1 Corinthians 15, 9 or Galatians chapter 1, verse 13. The whole body of professing Christians throughout the whole world. This is also sometimes referred to as the universal church or the invisible church. That's not a church that we see because we can't see all the believers in the world all at the same time. Wished we could, um, but that comes up again later because that's really important. The universal church, the invisible church. And then lastly, all the Christians in a particular city or area. Now, in Half Moon Bay and the Coastside area, there's quite a few Christians that live here. Uh, we don't all go to the same church, but that's the reference. All the Christians in a particular city or area either assembling together in one place or several places for religious worship, that's all ecclesia, a gathering of people for different purposes. Now, we know because Jesus has promised that when we gather two or more in a place in his name, that he'll be here in the midst. So we believe that whenever we get together here in this building, believers get together in his name for his purposes, that he's here. He dwells in our hearts by faith, but he also joins us in this assembly. That's his promise. I think that's pretty cool. Thus, all the disciples in Antioch, forming several congregations were one church. That's in Acts chapter 13. Also, we read about the church of God in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 2. We read about the, the church at Jerusalem in Acts chapter 8 verse 1. We read about the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2 verse 1. Uh, this is sometimes referred to also as the local church. That's where you and I arrive at this building on here on Parisma and Kelly Avenue uh, to join in with the great hordes of people that join in this vast auditorium every single Sunday morning and, and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday, we make up the church. There's one common denominator that's easy to spot, I think, in all these definitions of the church, and that is the church is made up of God's people. That's it. The church is made up of God's people. So what is the church to me? How should I see the church, not just this church, but the church. How do I see it? I was having an online discussion with some guy, if you've ever followed me on Facebook in any of my online discussions, um, who is stuck on this idea that when we refer to the church, we're talking about the Roman Catholic Church. You know, 1,500 year old Roman Catholic Church, that's what he thinks we're talking about. And then, ah, that's, that's the history of a church. It's the history of the Roman Catholic Church, not the history of the church. And uh, it's important to get that historically in your head. So how, how should we see it? Well, point number one is this. And there's only two points today on my sermon. And you might be thinking that's two more points than you usually have to your sermon. But it, there's only two. So point, point number one here today is this. And that is we become it. We become it. Now, uh, look there in, in verse 17. Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. It's interesting. In John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus tells Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you must be born again to see the kingdom of God. You can't even see the kingdom of God unless you're born again by the Spirit. Sometimes we take that to be, well, if you're not born again by the Spirit, you can't see it. That means you're not going to go there. Well, that's true, but I think it also means, too, you're not going to be able to perceive it here, now, if you're not born again by the Spirit of God. That word that's used there in John chapter 3, verse 3, when he says, you must be born again in order to see the kingdom of God, it doesn't just mean the act of seeing, 
visually to be able to observe it, but it's the actual perception of the object. I know what it is. I can see it for what it is. And, and I think that's what, it's, that's what it means. It's used in the sense of perception and participation in God's kingdom. So if you're not born again by the Spirit of God, you're not going to see it and you're not going to participate in it. Simple as that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, God's Word says this, The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. We've read that verse before. We've studied it before. And, and perhaps we think when we read that, well, gee, that sounds kind of elitist or sounds kind of like magical or something. Like you don't get a you don't you don't get to see all this. You have to be initiated. You have to have this special, you know, Holy Spirit glasses on to be able to see it. Well, pretty much, yeah, yeah. That's pretty much what it is. Um, and, and perhaps you've experienced this in your own life. I know that I have. Is uh, throughout the course of my life, I had read different portions of the Bible many times, many times over, and they meant absolutely nothing to me. I could open up the Bible, I could read the pages, and I could say, yeah, 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 I get it, I understand all of that, and it just meant nothing to me. And then I got saved. And then I was born again by the Spirit of God. Now I looked at the page, and it was very, very different than the last time I read it. Amen. Now it's all of a sudden, it's, it feels like it's speaking to me. It feels as if the things that it's saying are important for me, personally. Not just interesting in the general sense, but important for me personally. Well, th that's that transformation that must take place. Because apart from that transformation, you know, it's all just ink on paper. It doesn't mean much of anything. But not only, not only that, it, then we have, no, we have no sense. I like the word apprehension. You know, we're not a part of it. We don't feel the connection to it. There's no depth. There's no power, if any of that makes sense to you, uh, about our connection to God himself, to his word, or to his church. It's a transformation that has to take place in each and every one of us. Jesus says to Nicodemus that he must be born again. Everybody in this room has been born physically. I'm fairly certain <laughs> of that. Every one of us has been born physically, but each and every one of us must be born spiritually. And until we are, hold your finger at Matthew chapter 16 and turn over to John chapter 1. Just a few pages over. John chapter 1. John chapter 1 in verses 12 and 13. Listen to what God's word says about this necessity that we each have to be born again. Here's how it happens. It says here in John chapter 1 verse 12, But as many as received him, it's talking about Jesus here, as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God. This is a tricky this is a tricky verse. It's not tricky because it's hard to understand. It's really easy to understand. It's just tricky because we don't like it. Because we like to think that every human being is a child of God. Well, th this seems to indicate that they are not. And you've heard me explain it this way before, and it's the best one I can come up with. If you've got a better explanation, let me know. But every human being is a subject in God's kingdom. Every human being is a subject in God's kingdom. But not every human being is a child of the king. That's our choice. Will was praying about it a little bit earlier. You can surrender your life to Christ and you can become a child of God. Or you can remain a subject in his kingdom. Either way, subjects in his kingdom, you'll be judged according to his laws. Child of God, you'll be judged according to his grace. I don't know about you, I'll take grace every time. Law, I've been judged according to the law before. I'd like to not do that again. <laughs> So, it says here in John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. You were born here physically by 
the will of the blood. You were born of blood by the will of the flesh, by the will of man. You were born, you're here, you exist. But that's you exist physically. Until then, we are natural. We are not spiritual. This gives us some insight, too, into people's desperate attempts to make themselves spiritual and how frustrating that can be. Well, you know, I'm not religious. I'm spiritual. Are you now? Are you? The Bible says to become spiritual, I have to be born again by His Spirit. In other words, my spirit lies dormant, dead within me, until I am born again by His Spirit. And then when I am, my eyes are opened, and I am transformed by that Spirit. And now I can apprehend. Now I can see. See differently. Not just physically, but I can see spiritually. Is that elitist? Yeah, it is. You have to be born again. Is that exclusionary? Yeah, you have to be born again. Nobody's keeping you out, though. Nobody's saying you can't come in. Nobody's saying you can't be born again by God's Spirit. You can. All you have to do is surrender your life to Him. You can do it this morning. No big deal. Easy. So when Jesus says to Peter, I'm back over in Matthew chapter 16. So when Peter says, or when Jesus says to Peter that Peter's revelation of who Jesus is comes from God, we are reminded that we are blind until he opens our eyes. Remember what Jesus said? Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, hey, you're blessed, Simon, because flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but my father in heaven, my father in heaven opened your eyes so that you could see me for who I am. You follow? So then, we're blind until he opens our eyes. John chapter 9, verse 25, Jesus heals a blind man who's hauled before the religious experts of the day. And Who did this to you? How did he do it? Why did he do it? You remember the response of the young man who was made to see. He said, you know, whether this man's a sinner or not, I don't know. All I know is, once I was blind, now I can see. I can't explain everything about how Jesus has transformed my life. But I can tell you, once I was blind, now I can see. We're dead until he makes us alive. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Oh, we exist physically. But that's not necessarily alive. And some of you know what I mean when I say that. Physical existence is not necessarily living. So we're dead spiritually until he makes us alive. So now then we can see that the church... Not just this church, but the church that's made up of all the believers in the world, all the Christians in the world, the church is made up of people to whom the Father in heaven has revealed the Son. It's on your handout. The church is made up of people to whom the Father in heaven has revealed the Son. That's what the church is made up of. No, we don't join a church, but when we're born again by His Spirit, we become the church. We become a, a member of his body, as scripture says, and we'll get to that in, in coming weeks. And, and, and if we define it like this, then we can see that there's many people, many, many people that gather together in buildings called churches every week. But that doesn't necessarily make you a Christian. You can show up in a building and you can hang out and sing songs and you can listen to uh, uh, nut job bloviate from the pulpit for 45 minutes and and that that doesn't make you anything other than bored and hungry you know i you know it, attendance doesn't make you a christian or in the immortal words of wesley snipes just because you put a cat in the oven doesn't make it a biscuit so you you, you can some of you are working on the visual on that aren't you yeah. uh and you dog lovers are saying, let's try. Uh, <laughs> my, my mom won't like that. My mom doesn't like want to make comments like that about animals. We don't join a church. We become the church. Hey, look, there's lots of people that attend church every single week. Doesn't make them a Christian. And just because there's people gathering in a building doesn't make it a church. You can call a building a church all that you want. But a building doesn't become a church. People are the church. We come in and we use this building so that we can be the church here collectively together this morning. We are the church. 
We are uh, a part of the, the universal church. We are people uh, to whom God has revealed his son to us. And, and if you uh, are not that this morning, then God is revealing his son to you right now. So that you can become a part of his family right now. Not just a human being that exists on God's planet. But one of his own children in his own household. Now then... We can become connected to something far bigger than just a building or a name or an organization. We're now part of the universal church, all the believers of God in the world. We gather together in a local church, which happens to be this one. The name on the door says Calvary Chapel Half Moon Bay. We gather in this beautiful building that God's blessed us with here on the corner of Kelly and Prisma and beautiful downtown Half Moon Bay and we love being in here and it's comfortable. We have nice chairs, we have good snacks, we've got the jumbotrons, we've got great music, we've got wonderful people to hang out with. You're the church, not all the stuff. We could meet out in a vacant lot and do the same exact thing. We belong to the church, the church, the church of God, the church of people to whom he has revealed himself. Those that have been born again by his spirit that now have the crucified, resurrected Christ dwelling in their heart by faith. You're not born that way, but you can be born again. His church is made of us. Point number two. That is, he builds it. He builds it. Look at verse 18. And I, this is Matthew chapter 16. And, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. First of all, I want you to focus in on those words. I will build my church. Two obvious things right there. One is, it's his church. And the other is, he builds it. Now, thankfully... At least as far as I'm concerned, and if you see otherwise, then we can talk about it after church. I'd be more than happy to. Is Jesus is not saying here that he's going to build his church on Peter. God forbid that he would build his church on any man. As a matter of fact, if you, if you think that uh, that's what Jesus is saying, on, on this rock I will build my church on you, Peter. I'm going to build my entire church upon you. You're going to come up pretty short for evidence of that. There's absolutely zero evidence anywhere in the pages of Scripture that Jesus built his church on a man, much less Peter. There is every evidence, though, that he builds his church on himself. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, I'm quoting the NIV, where it says, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is on whom the church is built. And so what is Jesus saying when he says this? On what am I going to build my church? On the confession that Jesus is the Son sent from the Father revealed to humankind. But we can talk about that later if you want to. But for all our human efforts to build the church, why does he say that he will build it? Well, we can build, right? We can build. This church was, this building was built. And we can build big buildings. Uh, I, I told you I, I got saved at a church down in Southern California. And now that church is so big, I swear to you, every time I go down there, I expect to see a monorail running around the property. Uh, it is huge. I talk about, I joke about the jumbotrons here. They've got jumbotrons down there. It's massive. And, and I think we can build. We can build big and beautiful buildings. And uh, when I was growing up, I, I went to a Lutheran school. And I don't know why, but for some reason, Lutherans like architecturally designed, unique and interesting buildings. I don't, I don't know if you've ever noticed that. It seems like the Lutherans just gravitate towards unique architectural design. I don't know why. I could be completely wrong. Um, but hey, we, we, we can build buildings. That's fine. We can do all of that. Uh, we like that. We love organizations. We love activities. We love activities. We love doing stuff. I'm doing this. I'm doing this for the Lord, you know. I'm doing this for the Lord. 
You know, and, and sometimes I think God's in heaven thing. I, you know, I didn't tell you to do that. You know, you can do that all you want, but it's, you're not doing it for me. And I know you're not because I can see inside your heart. We can do all of that stuff. And sometimes all of this stuff, all of the buildings and all the activities and all the organizations, it comes to nothing more than monuments to men. That's what it comes to, monuments to men. And, and, I, and I get that. I understand why men do that. So how Jesus says he's going to build. How does he do that? Turn over. Keep your finger there in Matthew 16. Turn over to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. You can't miss it. It's right after Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 2. Starting in verse... Uh, we'll start at verse 38. This is um, the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost. And he feels compelled by God's Spirit to stand up and to preach a message. And the awesome thing about this message, including the numerous references to Old Testament books, is he just did this off the top of his head. You know, all that, that means to me two things. One is he was very familiar with the Word of God. And two, the Holy Spirit can do anything with somebody that's got his head drenched in his word. So get your head drenched in his word and see what God does with that. Let God's word marinate inside your skull. And so the Apostle Peter stands up on Pentecost. He opens up his mouth and he preaches this message. And it's a short message. God bless Peter. And maybe the response that he had was because it was such a short message. Maybe I should try that someday. <laughs> Just not today, right? <laughs> Amen. So in, in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 38, And then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, and as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, there it is, there's the rest of the sermon. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day, one day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. About 3,000 souls. That's quite a message. And then if you drop down to the latter portion of verse 47, it says, And the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. Notice how that reads in the context of what we've already been studying. That the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. To be added to the church, you got to be saved. Oh, you can attend. You can show up in the building. And you can say, well, I, I'm a member of that church. And notice we don't have any membership roles or anything here. All you got to do here is show up. We're pretty easy. But if you want to be a part of his church, the church that he builds, then you must be saved. Jesus builds his church by adding souls to it. Right? Jesus builds his church by adding souls to it. Now, every soul added to his church has a role to play in his church. And we're going to get to that in a future message. Just not today. But if today, if you've been born again by God's Holy Spirit, then you've been added into his church. Now, one of the greatest blessings in life, I've had the privilege of experience it, probably a lot of you have too, is to go to a far country and meet somebody that's a Christian. It's like an instant kinship. I, one of my greatest experiences in life, I'll never forget it, uh, it was I was in China on um, one of my trips over there, and I had an opportunity uh, to go visit a Chinese couple uh, in their home, which technically at the time was illegal. Uh, I don't know if it's legal now, but it was against the law to have a foreigner in your house. And so a Japanese friend of mine uh, knocked on my hotel room door and said, come on, we're going to go sneak off and visit these people, which we did. And, uh, and you know how well I blend in you know, with, the, with the Chinese people there in China. And um, so my friend is, is Japanese. Um, she only spoke Japanese and English. She didn't speak Chinese. And the couple that we went and visited, they didn't speak English or Japanese. And so we really could not communicate at all. Um, but they invited us in, and they gave us a cup of tea, and they gave me gifts, which was, you know, the most humbling thing of all. And then we prayed. And then we prayed. 
And、uh, my Japanese friend, she prayed in Japanese, and these two people prayed in Chinese, and I prayed in English. And I'm not kidding you, it was as if God kicked in the front door and just stepped into the room. He was that present. Now, we didn't know each other. I knew the Japanese girl. We didn't know the Chinese people. We didn't speak the same language at all. And yet, we had this instantaneous moment where we just connected. All of a sudden, we're just, we are like we're one. And it was,、uh, it was just the Holy Spirit of God that did that. And when, when you are born again by God's Spirit, when Jesus dwells in your heart by faith, and you meet somebody that is also a Christian who also has Jesus dwelling in their heart by faith, you will make fast friends with that individual. You'll make fast friends with anybody in whom dwells the same Holy Spirit that dwells in you. You understand that? And it's not just because you, you like them or you're, you're, it's somebody like you. You know, we like to do that. We make good friends with people that are like us. It's not that at all. It's that the same Jesus that dwells in you, that caused you to be born again, that's opened your eyes, is living in them. And you, and you recognize that. And now you've just made, not. Necessarily new friend, you've just met another member of the family. And in the same way, and this is how it applies right here in this room, is you can never hate another in whom dwells the same Holy Spirit that dwells in you. You can't hate anybody that's been born again by God's Spirit. Well, of course, you can't hate anyone at all. You don't, you don't, get, that, you don't get that right to hate. But you got this. In 1 John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, in verse 15, God's word says this whoever hates his brother, and he's speaking specifically about brothers and sisters in Christ, within the body of Christ, in the, in the church. So whoever hates his brother is a murderer. Yikes. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. If you have hate in your heart, you haven't even been born again by God's Spirit. Goes, those two things are incongruous. Oxymoronic, if that's a word. It's an oxymoron. You cannot have Jesus, the crucified, resurrected Christ, dwelling in your heart and hatred at the same time. Doesn't work. And then he goes on to say in 1 John chapter 4, in verse 20 and 21, he says, If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Just doesn't work. I always like it when people say, well, you know, the KKK, you know, they're all Christians.、I'm、like, no, they're not. <laughs> where, where, did you, where did you ever get that impression? Well, what most people do is because I call myself a Christian, that makes me a Christian, right? Because I call myself a Christian, I'm a Christian. Well, if you've been alive for very long, you realize that can't possibly be true because there's lots of people that call themselves Christians and their behavior is all over the map. So, what does that mean? Well, it just means to me they're either wrong, they're mistaken, self deluded, or they're struggling. Just struggling. And we can understand that. So, if Jesus is building his church by adding souls to it, then we have to ask ourselves this Are we participating in what he is doing? Right? Are we participating in what he is doing? In uh, uh, John chapter 14, verse 12, Jesus says this Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do. I've always been fascinated by that because I looked at the things that Jesus did and they're pretty darn great, right? And I don't always see myself doing the things that he's doing, and I certainly don't see the greater things. And I wonder this, and I put it in your notes, and it's up on the Jumbotron. I wonder if we're not seeing the greater things because we're not doing the works that he's doing. We're, we're not even participating. 
We may have an intellectual understanding of it and think, well, yes, that's how Jesus builds his church, by adding souls to it. Well, am I in any way, shape, or form participating with Jesus in the work that he's doing? Oh. Well, when you put it like that, I guess not. <laughs> you know, really, honestly, and, and again, this is an easy way to beat up the sheep here in the church and I certainly don't want to do that and you guys know that I like the word alignment here when it comes to walking with Christ I like the word alignment the, all those acts of obedience that we do, all those things bring us into alignment with God and with his purpose and I, and I like that so I like the word alignment when it comes to walking with Jesus. And, and maybe, maybe this is a breakdown point. We want to be and we strive to be in alignment with Jesus by doing what we believe is right. That's good. That's correct. But if Jesus is building his church as he said, are we participating in that? Is that something that we're not participating in because... If we want to see the greater things that he talks about there in John chapter 14, verse 12, I think we have to be doing the other things first, right? So maybe we need to be a little bit more active and involved in being a part of how Jesus builds his church, which is adding souls to it. And, and the simple side of it, which has always been the easiest side for me, is just inviting people. And just inviting people to church. And I, I know the church that I got saved at our pastor was an amazing evangelist. I went to that church for 14 years, and in 14 years, I never saw a church service where somebody didn't get saved. Never saw it. Somebody got saved in every single service, every single time. 14 years, never saw it, that change. Well, why? Well, we had this mentality, I did anyways, that if I can just get my friends to come to this church, they're going to get saved. That's just how I saw it. If I can get them to this church, they're going to get saved. Did all of them get saved? No. But a lot of them did. I was surprised, actually, how many of them did. So sometimes, you know, the easy, the simple part is we just invite people to church. But the real part is, is are you leading anyone to Christ? That's the real part. You're the witness. You're the, you're the, the tip of the spear, so to speak. You can reach people that I can't right here and right now. But you can be God's mouthpiece to them, wherever they are. We want to be involved in what Jesus is doing. Some years ago, there was a movie. I don't know why I remembered this. There was a movie called Living Out Loud. That sound familiar? I don't know if any of you saw the movie. I never saw the movie. I just remembered that title, Living Out Loud. And I thought, if I'm living out loud, what is my life saying? And in this past week, it's saying, I love sugar. That's what my whole life said like every day I love sugar where's the, where's the rest of those chocolates don't we have any more cookies in the house and at our house we've always got something always Jesus is building his church by adding souls to it I want to be a part of that work what happens when we get here what happens when we get here into this building and how that all works out, that's coming up in future sermon. We're going to take a couple of weeks on this one. Because today on the first day of the new year, just another day, but, you know, we turn the calendar and my watch says it's the first. So it's the first day of a new year. I want, to, I want us to get a fresh perspective on church. Not just this church, but church. I want, I want us to get our heads into the game on that. What church is. And then by extension, how that impacts this particular gathering, local gathering of believers here in Half Moon Bay. As with any church, our church is unique. Look around. <laughs> our church is unique. The building means nothing. But you, however, mean everything. In one way, it is kind of all about you. Because Jesus saves you so that he can add you into his church. If you've been born again by his spirit, then you've been added into this otherworldly collection of souls that make up his kingdom. And if you think about that again, you're, 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 you know, we look around this room, I say this frequently, we wouldn't even know each other. We wouldn't even have anything to do with each other if it wasn't for Jesus. 
seriously. And we tend to hang around with people that are like us. Well, in this room, there's lots of people that aren't like you, and lots of people that aren't like me. And you would say, amen to that. <laughs> you know? We know each other because of Jesus. And I'm eternally grateful to that. So if you're sitting in this building this morning, or if you're listening online, or however it is that you're hearing this message, and you're feeling like you're on the outside of the church, you're on the outside of what I've just been describing, well, you have to know now that he's inviting you in. He wants you to come in and to be a part. He, di he didn't shut the door in your face. You're the one that's standing on the outside. Stop standing on the outside. Don't just step in the door of the building. Step in the door of his church, the church that cannot be seen, the church that is occupied by all, all those to whom God has revealed his son. And he's revealing his son to you this morning. Jesus Christ, son of God, God the son, born into this world, died on the cross to pay the price for our violations of his law, rose again on the third day, now able to live in your heart by faith when you surrender your life to him. And he causes you to be born again, transformed by his Holy Spirit, and added into his church. Not this church, his church. That's your opportunity today. So stick with me over the next couple of weeks as we get a fresh perspective on what is the church. Then we'll get back to 1 Peter. Let's pray. Jesus, uh, help us to expand our thinking. Broaden our understanding of your church. Who you are in relation to it. How you build it. How you maintain it. What do you want to do with it? Lord, because... Your church is us. It's just people. And it's those of us that have been born again by your spirit. And I, I just pray, Jesus, that you just help us to comprehend this a little bit more here today. Help us to see the privilege that it is to be a part of your family. Help us to see, Lord, how you're building your church and show us our part in it. Lord, but uh, perhaps most importantly, we want to see that you are the head of this church. All the accoutrements are irrelevant, Lord. We want to see you, the king, the ruler, the one who reigns over everything. So, Lord, remind us this morning that we are your church. And even as we have gathered, Lord, if there's anybody here this morning that has never genuinely surrendered their life to you, I pray that they would. Even as we're praying right now, Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You're not paying attention to me or to anything other than just lifting up your heart and your mind to the Lord himself. And as we do this, you can pray and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior right now. Again, you're not joining this church. You're not becoming a religious person. You are being reconciled back to God who made you through his son who died and rose again from the dead. And all that is required from you is just honesty from your heart. To be honest with him and to cry out to him. And you might say something like this, Jesus, I need you. Please come into my heart. I'm stepping across the threshold into your kingdom. And I need to be born again. Awaken that spirit that you created within me. Fill me with your spirit. Forgive me of my sins as I surrender my life to you. Now, as you've prayed that, all you need to do is be honest with him. And if you've been honest with him, then he's going to be genuine with you. Expect that he'll follow through on that as Jesus comes into your heart and awakens you. And now, Jesus, as we leave this place, I pray that we wouldn't think that we're leaving the church, but that we're taking the church out into the world with us. Help us to be participants in how you build your church, Lord. And thank you that we're a part of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.